Despite efforts to curb climate change, carbon dioxide emissions have continued to rise over the past 10 years. Countries and companies urgently need to mobilize for a greener future. Companies are going to have to make a distinction between trying to look good uh, and actually having impact. Promises are easy to make. Delivering on them is more difficult. Zani Minton Beddoes, our Editor-in-Chief, spoke with Bill Gates about what needs to be done to fund the green economy. Let's start with how this year, how COVID has affected your thinking on the climate. I think in a recent blog post you wrote, COVID-19 is awful, climate change could be worse. So what has this year taught us about how we need to approach the climate crisis? Well, climate is, is like the pandemic in that we really count on governments to think about the future, to bring in experts, and avoid terrible things happening out in the future. In the case of the pandemic, it wasn't taken seriously. Uh, there wasn't much preparation. And so now we're paying the huge consequence. There is a difference though, which is that the pandemic, uh, over a period of years, we can innovate, come up with a vaccine in particular, and bring it to an end. Climate is something that's slowly getting worse and worse, and there's nothing uh, anywhere near to a vaccine, you know, where for tens of billions of dollars, you invent it, manufacture it, get it out to people, and the problem goes away. Here, climate change is a side effect of the entire uh, physical economy. So it's not as easily solved. It's, it's, it's coming, it's inevitable. How do you frame the climate challenge? And particularly, is it primarily a challenge of behavioral change, that we need to change the way we live to be more sustainable? Or is it a challenge of innovation, that we need to find new technologies that allow us to live in a, in a carbon neutral way? We're not just trying to reduce emissions by 15% or 20%. Uh, we're trying to get to zero. And since the kind of activities that create greenhouse gases today are pervasive. You cannot drive the demand for those services down uh, all that dramatically. In fact, in developing countries, you should allow uh, the demand for those services to go up. And so it, although it always helps, every little bit helps, you can't get anywhere near zero without having a new way of making steel or uh, propelling a passenger car or a plane, uh, it, it requires an innovation where the extra cost of doing it the clean way, which I call the green premium, uh, through innovation is brought down ideally to zero, uh, but if not to such a small level uh, that, um, you know, say India would choose as they build those buildings and add that electricity capacity, uh, that they would do it the, the green way. So we'll get to how to bring that green premium, as you call it, down in a second. But let's start with the innovation that's needed itself, and, and particularly in two dimensions. Let's start firstly with what are the renewable technologies right now that you think are the most promising that need to be scaled up? Well, it's phenomenal that uh, the cost of wind, both onshore and offshore, has gone down a lot. Uh, it's phenomenal that Lithium batteries uh, that allow passenger cars to get reasonable range, that the premium and cost of electric cars isn't gigantic today uh, and will come down over time. And then solar cells, which have come down in, in cost more rapidly than almost anyone predicted. So those three things are good. Uh, sadly, there are many things that those don't solve like making steel or cement or flying a plane. We just don't have a clue uh, of how to make those in a completely green fashion. So those are areas where we don't even have the technology to make the products in a green way. So we have to have that innovation. And then, as you say, we have to bring the price down, the green premium, as you call it, such that they'll be used. Let's talk about how we get there. Um, and in particular, what is the role of the private sector? You know, what do you think is, it's one thing having philanthropic money, but you're going to need large amounts of capital mobilized to do this. So how, how do you get there? Yeah, so for each technology, 
you have to say, where is it? Uh, and as we discussed, the solar, wind, uh, and the lithium batteries are fairly mature. And, and so just a little bit of tax incentives are driving those things forward. That's, that is a good thing. The technologies like making green steel are still very much at an R&D stage. And so you want, uh, at the beginning of this pipeline, to raise the research budgets of the rich countries to work in these areas. You know, then at the next stage, you want to raise the uh, risk-oriented capital, either inside a big company or in a startup, uh, to go and do this work. But here, when you're building these big steel plants, you're coming up with a product that's not differentiated. Green steel, sadly, uh, has no uh, benefits beyond its, its greenness. You know, who wants to be the first to put <clears throat> green steel in their building? Why should you, you know, take a risk that maybe it's slightly uh, inferior in some way? And so uh, we, we can use our, we can look at venture funding, but we need uh, the scale of capital and the, the persistence is going to be more difficult. Presumably one way of getting there is to change the regulatory environment to change incentives. So I guess one question is how essential is at a, at a governmental level, you know, a carbon tax or something that prices carbon to create the right incentives? Yeah, it's absolutely a carbon tax if it's politically adoptable, if that can practically happen, a carbon tax at quite a high level that you know has some resemblance to the green premiums for these products, uh, so it would have to be like a hundred to two hundred dollars a ton. That sends out the clear uh, market signal. Now, sadly, you know when people put like France, you know, put a bit of a tax on diesel fuel, or when the U.S. politicians talk about carbon taxes, the chance that we'll get a, that sort of straightforward, clear uh, policy, I don't think is very likely. And so we do have to be creative and say, okay, if you don't have that, uh, let's look at some of the individual sectors, and let's look at the companies who make a lot of money, and uh, let's look at the government's own use of these products and somehow perform the bootstrap without that. I mean, Microsoft has adopted the goal of reducing its total emissions, including historical ones, I think, to net zero. Should that be a goal for all companies? Well, we, we expect leadership from companies that are big and profitable and doing well and you know have the IQ to have a department that's really thinking these things through, and the technology companies through their data center or PC products, directly and indirectly, uh, they're responsible for a measurable amount of emissions. But yes, these companies, uh, they want to solve these problems. Their employees want to solve these problems. And it's the metrics about, uh, you know, just buying what's called the Renewable Energy Credit, or REC, you know, has allowed people to say, oh, we just use the green electrons. The standards for being able to say that you're green will be raised. Companies are going to have to make a distinction between trying to look good uh, and actually having impact. And you know, are they participating in getting beyond the renewable energy credit thing? Uh, are they participating in getting, if they're, you know, are they really starting to have an internal carbon price? Are they taking the money from that and putting it into activities <coughs> that will make a difference? You know, just reporting, yes, that's a good thing, but, you know, a steel company is going to report a large number. An electricity utility that's providing a reliable electricity is going to put a large number. That doesn't mean that, oh, let's not finance them anymore. Nobody should work there. You know, these services are very, very important. There's a reason we haven't made gasoline illegal. And what about the U.S.? You know, still the world's largest economy, the one who's whose federal policy, shall we say, has, has kind of bucked the trend thus far. Uh, can the world really make progress without serious progress in the U.S.? Basically, no. Uh, in two dimensions, the U.S. has got to be an exemplar. We have to uh, 
move our consumption, even uh, paying green premiums uh, to get the volume for those products to get scale, which drives the green premium down. So the U.S. has to be a buyer uh, as of those things, including in the hard categories. You know, I can't emphasize enough the overfocus on the easy stuff. I've never seen a domain that in all the meetings are about, hey, electric cars, oh, this problem solved. Come on, tell me about steel, come on. Department of Energy it hardly even thinks about steel because they're about energy. They, they aren't the Department of Steel making or the industrial processes. And, you know, show me, you know, tell me what the green premium for steel is. Who is the best uh, in class? Right now, you'd have to go buy direct air capture is, is, would be your only way of, of saying, you know, which I as an individual want to across all my things. So I'm going to buy individually direct air capture to offset the, you know, it's not that gigantic amount of steel that I'm, I'm connected to. So the U.S., uh, without the U.S., this, you'll never meet anything like a 2050 goal. You won't meet a 2060 goal because our innovation power for the entire world and our missions and leading by example is certainly a necessary but not sufficient part of this movement. So if you had a U.S. president who was serious about doing this and, you know, Joe Biden says he wants to spend $2 trillion decarbonizing the U.S. economy, where should he start? <clears throat> well, the key thing is innovation. You know, I, I'm sort of a one-trick pony in terms of what I understand. That $2 trillion, a fairly modest part of it, needs to be devoted to driving markets uh, to buy at the current green premium and get that volume learning curve going. We have to fund basic R&D. We have to encourage risk-taking capital. And we have to create a demand-side signal for the lowest premium products so that over time their prices do what uh, solar cells uh, did. And, and so, yes, I... I'm very excited that he wants to put a lot of resources into this and helping to be part of that dialogue to make sure that money's well spent. Uh, you know, I, I'd look forward to that opportunity. So your message that innovation is the key has come through loud and clear. What about your assessment of the odds of success? I guess to end this conversation where we started it, has the pandemic and the experience of this year raised your assessment of those odds? So far, I'd say, you know, it looks like people are going to keep in mind the, the need to invest and invent for this long-term problem, even though often when you have short-term problems, you, you ignore those long-term things. So I'm amazed that the advocates here have said, okay, you know, what's the lesson from this? And so that recovery fund thing or the fact that, you know, Biden doesn't feel that he has to uh, uh, get rid of his climate focus uh, to help recover, that he feels both of those things can be done. So, so far, I'd say uh, it, it looks, looks more positive than negative. Well, that seems a suitably upbeat place to end. Thank you, Bill. As always, fascinating. All right. Thanks. Bill Gates was talking to us for the Economist event Sustainability Week in October, part of a series of global events aiming to accelerate action against climate change. To register for Sustainability Week 2021, or to find out more about future events on climate change, click on the link. Thanks for watching.